Okay, well, welcome everybody. My name is Pete Bulkran. I am the computer. Oops. Um, I'm the computer systems administrator for the AOS department. Uh, I got my bachelor's degree in meteorology here in 1988 and my master's in atmospheric science in 92. Uh, I did a bunch of computer modeling with one of the professors here back then, managed our group's computers, and kind of worked alongside the department computer person back then. When she left, they hired me, so I've been doing this since 1995, so 27 years. Probably longer than maybe some of you have been alive, which is kind of terrifying. But anyways, my uh, my contact info is on there. If you have any questions after the fact, uh, feel free to use me as a resource. Like I said, I've been working with Unix for a pretty long time, so um, if you have a question or a problem, chances are I can help you, or maybe not. <laughs> you never know. Anyways. Normally, when I go through this talk, I do a little bit of an intro of this classroom. Are there any of you that have classes in here that actually use these computers? I'll go through that pretty quick because I kind of aim that at our undergrads. But um, these computers are all dual boot Windows 10 or CentOS 7 Linux, which is the default operating system usually. Uh, I encourage you, if you are working in here on the computers, log off when you're done and make sure that the computer is running Linux when you leave so that somebody else doesn't walk in and not know what's going on. There are 15 computers in here that are available, and there's also four computers that are set up exactly the same way in room 1443, which is on the other side of the building right next to my office. Um, all of them are attached to the same network, and if you log in using your user ID here or on the Jupyter Hub, you'll have access to the same stuff in the computers down the hall. Also, the computers at the front of our other classrooms are all set up the same way. And there's the Jupyter Hub server. A lot of you in our department have been using that, which you can log into using a web browser and run Python. So that's the address for that. So when you first walked in, you probably saw something that looks like this. Uh, that means that you're running Linux. It's a kind of a red background with a logo on it. Enter your username and password, or the guest username, which is AOS, and the password, which I've got written on the board up there. Let me know if you try to log in and have trouble. I can you set up on that. Um, to reboot from Linux into Windows, there's a power button in the very upper right hand corner. If you click on that and do a restart, it will reboot the computer. When it reboots, you're going to come up with a, a it's called the Grub menu. Uh, it's a boot menu that has a, probably a number of different Linux options on it and then Windows at the bottom. So if you select Windows, of course, this is a pretty old uh, slide. It says Windows XP, but there should be a Windows option at the bottom. Sometimes there's two of them. Um, either one of them work to get into Windows. Um, the guest AOS username and password works on Windows too. In fact, I don't have individual user accounts on the Windows site here anymore. Uh, people generally weren't using it, but if you need quick access to a Windows machine, print something out or whatever, um, feel free to use that. Um, Oh, that's another thing. The AOS account on both Windows and Linux in here is not on the server. It's only tied to the individual machine. So if you come in here, log in using the AOS account, leave and come back and want to access something that you downloaded or whatever, you've got to go back to that same whatever machine that you were sitting in front of. If you have a real account in here, like your NetID based account, those actually live on the server down the hall. And it doesn't matter which machine you log into, you'll have the same home directory, the same files that you save and everything, so uh, on the Linux side. Um, various software available under Windows, Microsoft Office, OpenOffice, some of the Adobe products, various web browsers. Uh, NGCM is a educational version of a climate model that they use in some of our classes. Hydra, I think, is a, a like a um, radiation uh, modeling tool, and some other stuff as well. To reboot back, of course this is an old uh, slide as well, but in the lower left hand corner you'll see the start menu, which somehow Microsoft thought it was a good idea to start to stop, but um, it, the start menu and restart it, and when you get to here, choose the very top Linux line, 
the other Linux lines that are on there are there for like debugging or if something's wrong with the most recent version and you need to go back to fix it. But the graphics won't work correctly with those because that's tied into the version of Linux that you're using. So it's always a very, in here anyways, the very top version of Linux is what you want to use. And that'll get you back here. Um, we talked about this already, that AOS uh, is a you know, guest username and password, or if you have your own username and password, you can reset the login. Um, on the Linux desktop in here, uh, it's going to look basically like this. There's an applications menu in the upper left that you can click on to get access to stuff, and there's various things under these other sub-menus. Um, there's also a places and a system menu that you generally won't use. Um, under the system tools at the very bottom, there should be an item called terminal. So if you want to do work on the, get the command line, uh, that's where you would get access to that. Uh, another way of accessing that is if you right click in the background and select open terminal, it'll get you also to a terminal window. And you can have many terminal windows open at the same time. Uh, logging off, you should be able to go into the system menu and choose log out of whatever username you're in, or there might also be something in the upper right hand corner. I think the version of Linux that I have in here now, it's in the upper right hand corner. Uh, I might be wrong in that. basically this classroom. Any questions about that at all? I mean, it's fairly straightforward, but if you come in here and you're not used to it, it might be kind of hard to figure out how to get logged into the machine to do anything. Everybody's all good? Okay. So this is basically the rest of the night, what we're going to talk about. Um, real quickly, what's an operating system? Uh, nobody cares what I talk about it anyways. Um, a brief history of what Unix is and how it came to be. Basics of logging in. Uh, I spend a fair amount of time talking about the Unix file system because that can cause a lot of confusion if you don't quite understand what it is and how it's laid out. Uh, spend a fair amount of time working with files and directories. Talk about your environment and a whole bunch of common commands that, you'll, that you would use uh, in the terminal. Uh, a little bit about compilers, email, text processing, web browsing, uh, image processing. And then when we get to the very end, um, I've got about 15 minutes at the very end on the VI editor, or VIM if you might have heard it called. If you are not interested in the VI editor, I won't be uh, offended if you get up and leave at that point, because usually my voice is going and everybody's tired and burned out. But if you're interested in learning a little bit about how to work with the VI editor, I do spend, I have about, like I said, about 15 minutes, there's about 8 or 10 slides on various uh, aspects of using the VI editor. So, that's what we're going to talk about. So the operating system is the main program that controls all the other parts of the computer. When you first turn it on, that's what you see, right? It might be Mac OS, it might be Windows, it might be iOS or Android on your phone. Uh, Linux and Unix are a version of an operating system as well, and that's what we run a lot of our scientific computing in this department under. <coughs> Unix has been around a long time. Uh, it was created in 1969, so not quite as old as me, but close. Uh, Basically, it's been around a long time. That's what this slide is supposed to say. Um, there's two main variants, but they've kind of blended together. And the main differences between them, the options to a lot of the programs are different sometimes. And you can a lot of times use that to determine whether your, your system is more of a System 5 type Unix or a BSD uh, type Linux. Um, most modern Linuxes are generally more like a System 5 Unix. Than a BSD. And in fact, Unix is a, actually a licensed operating system. You have to actually pay someone to use Unix. This guy named Linus, Linus Torvalds wrote like 
a clone of it. Like he, it's not Linux, it's not Unix, but it basically does everything that Unix could do, and it's free and open source, so anybody can use it and download it. Um, so it's basically, for all intents and purposes, Unix, but it's not Unix. Um, usually, if you install Linux on your computer, you're going to be installing it as a distribution because Linux itself is just the kernel. It's main. It's just the program that handles allocation of the CPU and memory disk and stuff like that. Um, to actually do anything useful with it, you have to have a lot of programs that go along with it. And that's where these distributions come along. Um, you may have heard of Ubuntu. A lot of people, that's a pretty popular uh, Unix dis Linux distribution. I'm going to use the words Unix and Linux interchangeably here. But Linux is really what I'm talking about. Um, Ubuntu is a pretty uh, popular uh, distribution, and I use that on a lot of parts. If we're installing it on a laptop, I'll usually use it because it tends to be a little bit more on the cutting edge in terms of drivers and stuff. Um, Ubuntu is a, a distribution that's based on Debian, and both of those use a similar distribution method, which is called package. All of the different things that you can install are come as packages. Uh, as opposed to uh, Red Hat is a corporation that uh, produces a, a, a version or a distribution of Linux and they sell support for it. So you, you actually have to pay if you want to run Red Hat Linux. But because it's all open source, everything that Red Hat, almost everything that Red Hat publishes, because it's based on open source software, they have to make the source code available. And because the source code is available, other people can go and grab it and rebuild the whole operating system outside of the Red Hat environment. Um, so that's where this CentOS, the Community Enterprise Operating System, came from. Then Red Hat bought CentOS and changed it so that it's now more of a development tool. It's not just a rebuild of Red Hat, it's, it's something else. Um, so now, starting with the version 8, there's a version called Rocky Linux, uh, which is, again, a free recompile of Red Hat. You can go out, download it, install it on your computer for free. Um, you don't get a lot of support from them. If you have problems with it, you're kind of on your own, but it's free. So, you know, as opposed to Windows, it'll you know, cost money, Mac OS, you may get by the Mac, it costs money. So, anyways, um, Red Hat, CentOS, and Rocky are all based on a package management tool called RPM. Every day, all of the different things that you install are, are going to be distributed as RPM. Uh, and that's one really nice thing about Linux. You know, when you get a Mac or a Windows machine, you know, you've got the operating system, and you might have some rudimentary text editing or, you know, image, you know, like Microsoft Paint or something kind of like that. But to get any real useful software, word processing or image processing or, you know, video editing or anything, usually costs a fair amount of money to add that on. Uh, and it doesn't just come with the computer. You have to get it after the fact. With Linux, a lot of that stuff is included. And it's not the name brand stuff. Like, for example, uh, Photoshop is a, a photo editing suite that Adobe produces. There's a package called the GIMP, which is called uh, it's General Image Manipulation Program. I think it's where that acronym comes from. And it basically does everything Photoshop can do, but it's free. So, and you can install it, you know, right, right as you're installing your Linux on there. So, Really, really pretty cool, and that's why we use it because it's free, basically. Um, okay, so Unix has been around a long time. It was written by computer programmers for computer programmers. Um, everything is an abbreviation. Almost everything that you do is going to be an abbreviation. And my guess is because you know they're computer programmers, they're typing all day long, and the less they have to type, the better. So they made everything an abbreviation, so they don't have to type as much. Um, everything is case sensitive in Unix, so it matters whether you use capital or lowercase letters. That goes for file names, it goes for commands. Um, there's maybe one or two options where that's not the case, but in general, everything is case sensitive. It's almost entirely lowercase, so all of the commands that you enter are almost always going to be all lowercase. Almost always. And they're almost always abbreviations or shorthand for something longer. So for example, the command to list the files in a directory, we'll talk about this later, is ls. Right? It's not list or directory or something like that. Um, 
So, any questions so far about that? Pretty clear. Okay, so when you log in to a Unix session, and from now on, just about everything I'm talking about applies to the command line. So whether you open a terminal window, or whether you remotely connect to a Unix machine through uh, another, uh, like a terminal emulator, or like from the, the terminal on a Mac OS, um, it's all <coughs> command line based. When you first log in, the operating system is going to start a program on your behalf called a shell. And the shell uh, is what basically interprets your commands and passes them along to the operating system. There's a number of different shells that are out there. Uh, in the early days, when it was in the early days of Unix, there was one shell called the Born shell, and that's usually uh, abbreviated SH. And then there was the C shell, which is abbreviated CSH. Um, the Born shell. Uh, in my experience, tends to be more useful for like scripting or like background processes. It's maybe not quite as friendly if you're sitting in front of it and actually doing things in it. And the C shell uses basically a lot of common syntax with the C programming language. So if you know how to program in C, you know a lot of how to do things in the C shell. Um, in my experience, that tends to be a little friendlier to actually work with rather than like batch background scripting. <coughs> In the years since, people have taken these versions of these programs and enhanced them and made additional features that didn't exist in a lot of the earlier shells. Um, TC shell is an advanced version of the C shell. It has things like you can use the arrow keys to get back at your history, and you can do some other, other fun stuff that C shell didn't have. Uh, that is the, the shell that is the default shell if you have an account in here. I always use the, the TC shell um, there are some programs that we use that just play a little nicer than TC shell than any of the others. Um, you might have heard of the corn shell, that's another shell that a lot of people have used, although I haven't seen it as much recently. Uh, Bash is a, a shell that's similar to the Born shell, but again, it has a bunch of enhancements to it. And uh, so they call it the Born Again shell uh, for Bash. Um, that used to be the default shell if you open the terminal window on Mac OS. Um, recently, starting about two versions of the operating system ago, they changed that and they're, they're now using something called the C shell, which has real similar syntax to Bash. A lot of the same things work. Uh, but apparently Bash is, the licensing that they use didn't allow Apple to upgrade it beyond a certain point without, I don't know if they had to pay money or if they had, there was some, some licensing issue. Um, so they were stuck at a fairly old version of Bash and they couldn't update it. And so they, they went with the C shell, which I think is an open source shell, and they're able to keep it pretty much entirely up to date. Um, one thing in here, um, your default shell will be TCSH, but if you're programming in Python, the version of Python that we use in here plays a lot better if you're using Bash. And if you want to start a bash shell, you can open a window, and even though you're running TCSH, if you just type bash, it will start a bash shell on top of the TC shell, and then all of the bash stuff will work after that. You just have to remember to start bash um, every time that you want to use it. It is possible for me to change your shell in here, but that'll break a lot of other things if you're using Gempack or some other things in here. Um, a lot of the stuff that I have set up ahead of time to make things work doesn't exist, or I don't have it set up for Bash, so that, that could cause some issues, but it's, it's possible. Um, so what does the shell do? Um, you can create an environment that meets your needs. Linux is very customizable. You can change the prompt. You can change um, what the different commands do. You can write aliases and shell scripts that are sort of roll your own commands. Um, I'll have an example of that later on, but for example, if you if you have a command that you type over and over and over again, it's a really long command, you can define your own name for that, like a really short version of it that expands out into the whole command, so you have to type the whole thing every time that you want to do it. Um, the shell keeps a history of the commands that you've used, um, so it remembers previous commands and you can have that go back like, to infinity. I think the default is like 20 or 100 that it'll remember. <clears throat> and you can go back and rerun previous commands that you had done. You can go back um, and edit previous commands with the arrow keys. Uh, 
Uh, and there's another feature that's pretty cool. Um, all of these shelves have autocomplete, so if you start typing on the command line, whether it's a, a program that you want to run or a file that you're trying to access, as long as your what you've typed is unique, it, you can hit the tab key and it will automatically complete that file or program name or whatever on the command line for you, which can save you a lot of typing. Um, then we can go through some examples of how to do that later on. Um, okay, so we'll talk more a little more about in the environment how you modify that later on. Uh, when you first log in, um, if you're sitting in front of a terminal, you might have a login prompt. You type your username, um, and I, I'll talk about how to remotely connect using Secure Shell later on. Uh, in here, obviously, you log into the graphical system and then open a terminal window, and you'd already be logged in, so you don't have to do that. Um, you enter your password, and this is where I have to give the password speech. Um, it's kind of important to have a good password because we don't want people breaking into our systems. Obviously, um, then you think, well, you know, I've had faculty before come up to me and be like, what do I care if somebody breaks in? I don't have anything. But, you know, what do they care about my weather data? <clears throat> and the thing is, it's not the weather data. It's the fact that we have fast computers on a really fast network. Um, and for example, if you were going to go break into a Department of Defense machine, you probably wouldn't like start trying to log in from home because you know, 10 minutes later, the minute black will be at your front door. Will be what's going on, you know, what are you doing? But if you log in from here to some computer at UCLA, and you log into some computer in Atlanta, and then you log into some computer in Toronto, and then 10 computers later, you're breaking into the DOD, they have to follow your path back, and by the time they get to you, logs might not be there anymore. You're less likely, I suppose, to get caught. Um, and so that's one of the main reasons why people would want to access our machines is for that nefarious stuff. So it's important to have a good password. Um, a good password is something that doesn't appear in a dictionary, English or otherwise. Um, if you can think of like a phrase and then like take the first letter, capitalize some words, change some things to like a number or a character, that's a pretty good password. Although this is actually pretty short now that could be cracked pretty easily. A better one would actually be just write that whole thing out. So for example, I hate having to change my password every three weeks. Uh, it's gonna take somebody a pretty long time to figure that out. <laughs> but if you, you know, if it's something that you hate changing your password, it's gonna be pretty easy for you to remember, right? So, um, Do It does have some guidelines on how to select a good password, those are here. Um, and I think that's part of the campus policy if you log into campus machines, they want you to have a good password. Um, so that's the password speech. Um, it is possible to log into a Unix or Linux machine more than once. You can be logged in many times, and, and in fact, more than one person can all be logged in and doing things at the same time. Um, which I guess I just previewed that. Many people can be logged in. Um, you can remote log in using Secure Shell. Uh, for Windows, there's a program you can get from the campus software library called Secure CRT. Uh, or you can, there's an open source version on the internet that you can use called Putty to remotely connect into Unix or Linux machines. Um, for the lab in here, I do have three remote access machines that you can log into remotely. It is possible to log into these computers in here remotely, but I generally recommend don't do that because they could be rebooted into Windows and lose whatever you have to be working on. Um, Cat3, Cat4, and Cat5.aos.wisc.edu are always only ever running Linux. So if you want to log in and do some stuff remotely, <coughs> they're set up on the same network, and when you log in, you'll be in your same home directory as, as in a shell up here. Um, so those are available to, to connect to remotely. <coughs> um, the graphics system that you're looking at, if you happen to be logged in, that was that red screen and, and then the blue background that you see, uh, that's called X Windows, and it's sort of separate from Unix or Linux, but it's the graphical, uh, the, the way that they do graphics. And it's possible, it's a, it's a client server mode, so you can actually have an X Windows server running on a different machine, run programs on a server, and have them actually display like on your laptop or you know, another desktop machine. Uh, 
Um, this URL here has some uh, information about how to set that up on Windows using Secure CRT and a program called Xmin, which is a free X server that works on Windows. <coughs> if you're on uh, a Mac, you can SSH right from the terminal window using this command. If you SSH your username, app, and then a remote machine, that, uh, you know, the, the full name of the machine, <coughs> that will uh, connect you remotely. And if you're going from OS or from Mac OS to a Linux ma Linux machine, you want to use X Windows. You need to add a minus capital Y on there, or sometimes it's a minus capital X. It depends. Um, generally, from a Mac to a Linux machine, I found the minus capital Y is what does it. Um, and there's a program. I don't think I have it. It's not on the slide, but there's a program called X Quartz, which is a free open source X server for a Mac. Uh, they used to include it in Mac OS a long time ago, and they stopped doing that. But it's free, and you can download it and, and install it. Um, when you install it, it'll make you log off and log back on to start it up. But then you're able to, like for example, run programs up here and have them display on your Mac or on your device. So when you first log in, you'll end up in your home directory, and that's the case whether you logged in up here or whether you logged in remotely. We'll talk a little bit about what that is. When you're done, it's wise to log off because you don't want other people messing with your stuff. Um, usually you can type log out or exit, uh, sometimes control D. Uh, whenever I use a hat like that or a, a carrot, that means the control P on the keyboard. So control D usually will close uh, and log you out of a session. If you're in here, you need to go up to that menu and type under the system menu and log out your username. If you don't, uh, I think eventually it goes into a sleep mode, but it's generally not a good idea to be logged into more than one of these machines with your user ID at a time because they can do weird things to each other. Um, so usually it's a good idea if you're, I mean, if you're going down to like, you know, get a soda or just going to get food or something, going right back, you can say logged in. But if you're, if you're leaving, it's, it's a good idea to just log out. Um, in other operating systems, other versions, sometimes you need to click exit, sometimes you need to right click in the background and select log out. There's various ways that that different window managers have to log out, but in general, it's a good idea to make sure that you're logged out so that other people don't do things maliciously to yourself. Um, okay, so your password. When you log in, you have a username and password. And if you're in, if you have an account in this classroom, I probably gave you a default password that your professor gave you when they set you up with the account. And they said you should change your password once you get logged in because otherwise everybody knows your password because everybody else in class has the same one, right? So the command to change your password is P-A-S-S-W-D. <clears throat> that works in here, and that also works on any Unix or Linux machine. Uh, when you type password, it'll come up, and it'll ask for your existing password, the one you currently have. Then it'll ask you to type a new one, and then it'll type you to ask you to type the new one again to make sure that you've typed it correctly. And if you didn't, then it'll ask you to go through that cycle again. Eventually, if it's successful, then from then on, you'll use your new password to log in. Um, the characters, when you're changing your password, won't show on the screen. There won't be any asterisks or, or stars or anything. It'll just be blank. Um, so you won't see that you're actually typing what you are. Um, so that'll work. If you don't remember your password, it's stored in a way that I or other systems administrators can't tell you what it is. I can't go in and look and see what your password is, but I can change it for you. So, uh, or the administrator. Whoever is the administrator of the machine, if you've forgotten your password and can't get logged in, talk to whoever's the administrator, whoever has admin rights on the machine, they can change it for you, which in the case of these computers, that's me. Um, so, you know, if you're working for a semester and then you go home for the summer and you come back in the fall and you don't remember what your password is, come and see me. A couple of commands. Uh, there's a command called ID, which will tell you the username that you're currently logged in as. Um, usually that's not a big deal because you're just logged in as you, but for somebody like me who logs in as an admin and I can change to be other users, uh, it can be helpful to know who I'm actually uh, interacting with the system as. There's a command called groups that will tell you what groups you belong to, and we'll talk about that in a little bit in terms of how, how file ownership is uh, handled and how you can change permissions. 
And then there's a root user. The, the administrative user's login name generally is root. They have permissions to do pretty much anything, including removing the operating system itself. I gotta tell the story. Um, one of our professors had an SGI running Linux here about 20 years ago, and he decided that he was gonna do a cleanup of files. He went through and wanted to delete a bunch of stuff. And the, the line continuation character in Unix is a backslash, so like this sort of a slash. So he said slash bin slash remove minus recursively, and then he meant to put a backward slash, and then he had a bunch of different directories and files that he wanted to remove with a slash after them. The problem is he didn't use a backslash, he used a forward slash. And it, we'll talk about in a little while, the forward slash is like the root of the file system. It's like, when he, when he did that, it started, it took a lot longer than he thought, and what was actually happening was he was removing everything, all of his operating system, all of his files, all of the Unix, everything. And he got a, about a third of the way to deleting everything by the time he realized what was up and stopped it, but by then it was too late. We had to reinstall it from tapes, I think it was back then. So anyways, be careful as the root user because you can cause a lot of damage to your system. Okay, questions so far? Everybody's good. Okay, if you do run into questions or have an idea of something that I say doesn't make sense, stop again. I'm happy to clarify or handle individual questions or whatever. So, the Unix file system um, everything on Unix is a file. Files are files, pictures are files, music files are files, directories or folders, as you might call them on. Windows are files, disks are files, monitors are files, mice are files, everything everything that you could have, other than a program that's actually running, which is a process, everything else is a file. So there's a bunch of different kinds of files. There's ordinary files, which is a text document or you know, programs that you might run or pictures, you know, JPEG images or PNGs or um, MPEG files or whatever. Everything's a file. Um, there are special files called directories, which is like a folder on Windows or, or on a Mac. It's basically a file that holds other files, so you can use those to organize your space to have things in kind of like um, a more organized than just having everything in your home directory. There are things called special files, which are used to represent physical devices, for example, printers or disks or your mouse or whatever, there's, there's files that represent all those things. And then there's files called pipes. A pipe is a, a special kind of file that takes the output from one command, which they then be used as input to another command. Um, a lot of the commands in Unix and Linux are pretty simple. They do one thing and they do it pretty well, but you can chain them together to do some pretty complex and, and elegant stuff. So, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Okay, every directory that you run into on a Unix file system or a Linux file system is gonna have at least two directories in it as soon as you create it. One of them is referred to with two periods, dot, dot, and that is a special directory that always refers to the directory above the one where you are now. We'll, I'll have a kind of a map of what the file system looks like in a minute, but it's always the one above wherever you are. And then there's another special directory called just a single dot, or the dot directory. And that always refers to whatever directory you currently are in. Whatever directory you've changed into, the dot in that directory refers to that directory. And every directory that you ever run into on a Unix file system is gonna have at least those two things in it. Um, the Unix file system is organized as a hierarchy or like a tree of directories starting with the root directory. I'll, I'll refer to that as the root directory. Uh, the root directory is sort of like my computer on a Windows machine. It's sort of like the desktop or the finder on a Mac. It's like everything else is underneath that main root directory. That's like as far up as you can go on the file system. And the file system looks something like this. So here's the root directory. <coughs> in this, this is not all of the directories that might be got another slide that has a little bit more in a minute, but uh, the slash bin directory, uh, and a lot of times I'll, I'll refer to the root directory as slash, just because it is a slash, so it's 
slash bin directory. That's where programs would live. Um, you might have a home or a home one directory in the, in the classroom here. There's actually a home, home one, home two, and home three where all the class home accounts are. Uh, there's a dev slash dev directory. <coughs> That's where all those special files for like disks and uh, mice and stuff like that live. <coughs> there's an etc directory, which is where a lot of the system config stuff goes. That's kind of like the um, the settings uh, on a Mac or like the control panel on a Windows machine. A lot of the configuration, like the network address and who's who has accounts on it. Printers, a lot of that stuff is stored under, etc. Um, typically, home directories are under slash home, so if you install Linux on one of your own machines, your account is most likely going to be under slash home. Um, the home, the AOS user on these accounts, their account is local to the machine, so it's on slash home. Usually, there's a slash lib directory, which has library files or like common chunks of of code that are used by a lot of different programs. Um, usually there's a slash temp directory, which is like, uh, it's, it's intended for temporary files. Like a lot of times when you open a file in an editor, it doesn't actually open the file. It makes a copy of it and you edit that copy until you actually save it back and then it copies it back to the original file. And that copy would be usually kept in the slash temp directory. And it's, it's used by just a lot of software on Unix for temporary storage of stuff that doesn't need the same thing. And then a lot of times you'll see a slash s bin, which is kind of like the bin directory, but the s means it's usually more system type files, programs and things that the operating system runs rather than things that you as a user would usually run. Um, so that's sort of how it looks like. Um, you can kind of see it's like a tree, you know, it starts with this bleeding slash and then there's a bunch of directories out to whatever directory you happen to be in. This is my home directory in the, in the uh, classroom. Several directories down there. I don't know how readable that is, but this is another example that I found. This is a pretty cool site that I came across actually today. Uh, TLDP is a Linux documentation project. Um, and this has a whole bunch of other examples. So they've got the bin directory, there's a slash boot directory, which is where a lot of the boot up stuff lives in the, in the Linux kernel itself. Uh, we talked about dev and etc. and home and lib. <clears throat> a lot of times on a file system you'll find a directory called lost and found. Um, if something bad happens, like the power goes out and some data, some files got corrupted, when the system comes back up it will rescue what it can of them and it'll put that stuff in this lost and found directory. <coughs> So if, if you have a power outage and you lose some data, you can go look in there and see if you can find it. Uh, sometimes there's a slash misc directory, which is for miscellaneous stuff. A lot of times there's a slash mnt directory, like a mount directory. Uh, that's for um, like external file systems, like a, a floppy disk or a floppy disk. This is pretty old. Uh, like a USB memory stick would get mounted under there or a CD. Um, a lot of times there's a slash net file system, which is where you, like network mounted remote file systems would get connected. Uh, a lot of times there's an opt folder, uh, which has to do with um, add-on software, like third-party software, um, a lot of times gets put in there. Slash proc is a folder that has information about the running processes. Uh, you can sometimes get some useful information about them in there. Slash root is different than the main root directory, but that's the admin user's home directory. And usually only root has access to that. And then underneath some of these directories, there's usually some other stuff. So for example, under etc., a lot of times there's a sysconfig, a lot of times there's an x11, which has information about the x window stuff. Uh, and under user, there's a lot of times, so there's, there's a slash bin directory, but then there's also this slash user slash bin directory. And usually stuff that's in just slash bin are things that you might need in like a rescue mode. Like if you're having problems with the system and you bring it up in like a single user mode, not fully all the way up, but just enough to fix things. Most of the stuff that you would need when you're in there is kept in slash bin. Whereas programs that you as a normal user would typically run while you're interacting with the system are kept under slash user slash bin or user. 
And then there's this bar thing too, which has a lot of variable stuff. Uh, things about the uh, packages that are installed on it, um, mail spools, printer spools, things like that. Okay, so when you first log in, you're placed in what's called your home directory. And every user on the machine has their own home directory. And everything that's in there, you will, um, in this case, it's probably going to be under slash home one, slash class, slash fall, and whatever semester you s first got your account in here, uh, and then your user can be after that. Um, if you run open terminal from the applications menu, it'll drop you in your home directory. If you right click in the background and say open terminal, since you clicked in the desktop, it's actually going to open it in the desktop folder of your home directory in here. Um, usually when you connect to a machine, if you SSH into a machine remotely, you're going to be dropped in your home directory. Um, you can find out what directory you're in and see the whole path all the way back to the root directory with the command pwd. That will tell you that stands for print working directory. It'll tell you what directory you're in right now and show you the entire path, starting with the leading slash to that directory. <clears throat> and I'm going to spend just a minute or two talking about absolute versus relative path names. There are various ways that you can refer to any individual file on the system. One of them is called an absolute path, and that means it starts with that leading slash. And you give it all of the directories starting with the leading slash all the way out to wherever you are. So in this case, if I'm referring to this file, the absolute path to it would be slash home one, slash class, slash fall 18, slash poker, slash directory one, slash file one. If I'm the user poker and this is my home directory, when I first log in, there's another way that I can refer to this, which is a relative path. In other words, it's relative to whatever directory I'm in right now. Okay, so if I log in and I'm in the home one class fall 18, poker directory. In that directory, there is a directory called dir1, and in that directory, there's a file called file. So both of these things, if I'm logged in as the poker user, and that's my home directory, both of those things refer to the same file, the same thing. Um, <clears throat> if I'm logged in as somebody else, this would still work, but this probably wouldn't, unless they've got a file called you know, that in their home. So, for example, if I now change into the dir1 directory, the cd is the command we use to change directories. Uh, so I can type cd dir1. Now that I'm in that directory, I can still refer to that file with the whole absolute path name, right? Because that hasn't changed. Even though I've changed what directory I'm in, it's still all those directories all the way up to that file. But now, a relative path name to that file, since I've changed into dir1, would be just file without anything in front of it. It just refers in a relative way to that file. <clears throat> a couple other ways to refer to that file. Remember I talked about the dot dot directory means the directory above you. So dot dot means my home directory slash dir1 slash file1. That would be one way of ref another way of referring to that file. Or uh, remember I said that single dot refers to the directory you're in right now. So dot slash that file also refers to that same file. You might think, why would you need a dot in front of this file? And it's just here and you can just type file one and access the same thing. Uh, I've got a use case for that that we'll talk about in a little bit. In terms of what you might want to refer to a file like that. This is kind of a rehash of what I just went over. Uh, I'm not going to go through this all right now because I already did and because you've got access to it on the sheet that I handed out. But this is basically just some common directories bunch more common directories. Um, note that the slash root directory is different than the root of the file system. Um, a couple of other places, um, slash user, slash include is usual where you'll find include files for like C programming, .h files. <coughs> um, this is an example of a home directory in here. A lot of times, not always, but a lot of times there will be a slash user slash local directory, which generally has, again, like the slash opt, it has third party added on and stuff. Um, usually when I back up systems, I'll back up things under slash user local, and I'll back up, so there might be a user local bin, a user local lib, a user local things like that. 
Um, usually I'll back up people's directories, but I don't normally back up the stuff under slash bin or slash user bin because if something happened, it would be pretty easy to just restore that from however you installed it in the first place. But the things that you've added on after the fact aren't going to be there with that. So you would want to make copies of that stuff. But I don't normally back up the operating system itself because that's pretty easy to recover from the source. <coughs> Okay, any questions about the file system? That all sort of makes sense? Okay. So again, Unix is case sensitive, so lowercase ls is not the same as a capital L lower s or a capital L capital S. That goes for file names, that goes for commands, just about everything. Uh, when you first log in, you're going to be presented, or when you open a terminal window here, you're going to be presented with what's called a prompt. And it's, it may look something like this, um, this is actually wrong, I should have a number sign next to it. Um, but for example, it might have information about the machine you're on, your username, and then what command number you're on. And when you do a history, it keeps track of the commands starting with one. You can go back and refer to them after the fact. And when you do a history, it'll show you a numbered list of commands you can go back to. Um, usually, when you're running T CSH or TCSH, <clears throat> your prompt will end with a percent and a number next to it. Not always, and you can change that. But usually it's going to look something like that. Usually, if you're in K-Shell or Bash, you're going to have a dollar sign or a number sign at the end, and usually a number sign indicates that you're logged in as an administrator, not always. And again, all of that stuff is customized, you can change all that. <clears throat> For running Unix commands, usually the syntax is going to be the command name, then some flags with a minus in front of them, and then potentially some arguments. <coughs> what, do you want, what things do you want this command to operate on? It might be a list of files, it might be people, it might be whatever. No, but in general, that's what the commands look like when you run them. Um, usually you'll use a backspace or the delete key. If, you, if you're typing along and you make a mistake, you can either hit the backspace key or the delete key to, to move the cursor backwards and erase stuff. Um, it's a little bit weird because some systems use the backspace code and some systems use the delete key code to go backwards. And if you connect from one to another, if you SSH in from one that uses the delete key to a machine that uses the backspace key, when you hit the backspace key, it's not with the delete key, it's not going to backspace, it's going to put these weird control characters on. A way to get around that is you can type STTY space erase space and then whatever backspace key you want to use to backspace. And that tells the terminal this is the key I want to use for backing up or for erasing. Um, so if you find yourself in that situation where you log in and it's, you know, backspace key isn't working, uh, it's giving you weird characters, you can type that to fix it. Um, and that, that will get reset every time you log in unless you put it in your in your startup files. And we'll talk about startup files in a little while. So if you, if you find yourself always doing that, um, it's possible to have it automatically done when you first log in, but usually it's not. Usually you have to do that every time. <coughs> um, Unix and Linux systems generally have online manual pages for just about everything. So if you want to know how to use a command, you can type man and then the command name to get the manual page for that. So for example, if you type man, man, it will give you the manual page for the man command, which is how you view manual pages. <clears throat> if you want to learn how to use the password command, you can type man password, and it should give you a manual page on how to use the password. Now, <clears throat> a lot of these manual pages were written by computer geeks, so sometimes they're not, the English is sort of Trying to understand what they're actually saying isn't easy. Um, I'm pretty good at translating from man pages into English, so if you get stuck and don't, something doesn't make sense, I'm happy to try to tell you in actual English what they're saying. Um, but, you know, there, there usually are manual pages, so if you're not sure how to use a command, it's usually available, the, the help is available to figure that out. <clears throat> Sometimes you may not know the name of the command that you're looking for, but you sort of know what it does. For example, if you're trying to find out a manual page on the C compiler, but you don't know what the C compiler is called, you can use the man with the minus K option, and then 
sort of a, like a, a subject or, or a contextual thing of what you're looking for. And this should send you return a bunch of um, commands that have to do with compiler. And then from there you can say, oh, the C compiler is GCC. And you can say man GCC and you'll get 100 pages of manual on how to use the GCC compiler. Or Fortran or whatever. So if you're looking for you know something else, you can use this and it's search based on sort of subject rather than the actual title. Okay, so I said everything on Unix is a file except for processes. When you run a program, it's going to start one or more processes, and that's how the kernel keeps track of what's running on the system. Um, everything that's running on the operating system has a unique process ID. And there's a command called ps that you can use to get at information about those processes. Um, if I want to find out, if you type just ps, it's going to show you information about the processes that are running in the terminal window in the shell that you're currently in. So you'll probably see the ps command that you just ran and along with the shell that you're running and maybe something else. <clears throat> and there's a whole bunch of options to modify the behavior of the ps command. For example, ps minus flu and then a username will show you all of the commands that the user poker is running, maybe 20 or 30 or 100. Um, and the f, I think, has to do with giving the expanded link. Uh, it, it changes how, how it displays some of the information about it, it's from numbers to actual uh, words. If you want to use, if you want to look at all of the processes that are running on the machine, starting with when you first turn it on and everything that everybody's running currently, you can do a ps space minus efl, and that should show you all of the processes by everybody that's running. Um, if you're on, remember in the very beginning I said there's two kinds of Unix, there's System 5 and there's BSD. PS minus EFL uh, on a true BSD system, PS minus EFL will not give you the information that you're looking for. Um, the, con the, the similar version is PS minus AUX will give you basically all of the information on a BSD type system. So you can try those two commands and one of them is probably going to work, the other one's probably not. And that kind of gives you an idea of what kind of a system that you're on. So here's an example. If I do a ps minus flu of my username, uh, in this case, my username had been used to start the MATLAB license manager. And so there's a couple of processes on here uh, in terms of running. There's a shell command that's running. This has to do with the new license manager. And then this is something that the license manager is doing, I think. Um, and then there's a fair amount of information on here that can be useful. So I'm not sure what these first two columns have to do with. This has to do with the username that ran the command. This is the process ID, and every every command on the system that's running has a unique process number. Um, I think they roll over at uh, some systems, it's like 32,000. Some systems, they go out higher than that. Um, and then the next, this P, and there's a header along the top here that tells you what these things are. So this, this is the PID. This is the parent process ID. In other words, what process ran this one? In this case, this, pro this program was run by 1048, 1048 was run by 1047, and 1047, it was initiated by the main kernel. So it, that's what the process that owns that one. So the C has to do with how much CPU it's using. That'll usually be a number between one and 100. Uh, the PRI has to do with the priority. It is possible to change the priority that a command has in terms of access to the CPU. As a normal user, you're probably not going to use that real often, but you can see what the priority was. Uh, a nice value, that's what's used to change that priority. Address and WCHAN have to do with the memory location on the machine that the command is, is uh, running at. The size has to do with how big it is. So these are all pretty small. There's really not a whole lot going on here, but if you're running you know, a big computer model or some data analysis thing, that might be significantly larger than that. Then it has when it was started, so this will either have a time or in this case a date because it was a while ago that I started it. I'm not sure what the question mark is for, that might be the terminal that it's connected to. 
and then the time has to do with how much CPU time it's actually consuming. Um, so that information can be pretty useful, and then of course the name of the command itself that ran. Usually when you run into this is if somebody, if a process goes crazy and is consuming either a lot of memory or a lot of CPU and nobody can do anything, then you got to go search around and find out what process it is and kill it. So that Okay, so there's another way of, of accessing programs. Um, so the, the process ID is this one. That's, that's where the PS command would get to. Within a shell, it also keeps track of things that are running. But they have like much smaller numbers. So you can use the jobs command to find out what jobs are running. And in this case, I have only one, and it's job number one. It's running, and it's called Firefox. It's possible to have more than one job running if you run things in the background. And the difference between the foreground and the background, when you run a command in the foreground, you don't get the terminal prompt back. It just it takes over the terminal and it doesn't give it back to you until it's done running. Which doesn't make sense for something like a web browser, right? If you start Firefox from a terminal window, you don't really need the terminal window once Firefox is running. You use the terminal window to do something else. So if you put Command in the background, it disconnects it from the terminal and just leaves it running, and you interact with it uh, with the mouse rather than doing anything in the terminal. Board. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, maybe. Um, if you need to kill a process, if you can get that process ID from the ps command, you can use kill and then the process ID number. Um, if you want to just pause it for a while, for example. Uh, when I was in grad school, we had research computer runs going, but we wanted to start up an operational run that was sort of time sensitive. We wanted to start it and have it complete and not be competing with the research runs. So I would use a kill minus stop on the, on the research run, let the operational run go, and as soon as it was done, I would kill minus continue my other job. And basically, it would, the kill minus stop just pauses it. It basically says, don't use any more CPU until I tell you to start using CPU. So it, it stays in its state in memory, but it's not actually using the CPU time. <clears throat> kill minus nine, so basically kill sends a signal. And there's like 20 or 30 different signals that you can send to process IDs. Uh, the minus nine signal, it's a terminate signal. So if you kill a job and it doesn't die, you can kill it with a minus nine and it's more likely to die. Um, sometimes a command will be so road or so uh, so so messed up that even a kill minus nine won't kill it. And if that's the case, usually you end up have to remove the computer and that'll start the thing from scratch the way. <clears throat> Within uh, a shell with this jobs command that I had before, if you know the number of the job that's running, um, you can if a job is in the foreground you can type control Z to stop it. So for example, if you're in a terminal window and you run Firefox and it's taken up the window and you want to, like, wait a minute, I want to do a command listening to this window. I don't need it to be run in Firefox anymore, but I still want Firefox to be up there. You can type Control Z and it'll stop the job. Um, and then you can type jobs and that'll tell you some information about it. Um, you can put a job in the foreground with the foreground uh, FG percent one or in the background with the background percent one. I'm going to just show an example of that. This uh, my homegrown HDMI stuff up here sometimes doesn't play with this. Anyways, um, <clears throat> that's how you can handle jobs. Um, Unix commands, where do they live? Typically they're in either slash bin or slash user bin or maybe use a local bin if you add them on later. Um, you might have a bin directory of stuff that you compiled and, and or programs that you wrote that might be your home directory. In here, there's a directory called slash research slash Linux underscore bin, which is a lot of programs that I've built <clears throat> they live on the server, they're not installed on every individual machine, but they're network connected to this to these machines, so, you can, so I have to only have to build them once and then anybody here can use them. Um, 
Um, okay. Uh, there's an environment variable. We'll talk a little bit more about environment variables later, but there's an environment variable called path, which is where Linux looks for programs. So there's only a specified list of places where the shell will look for things to run. When you type a command to try to run it, it will look in each of these directories sequentially, and the first time that it finds one, that's the one that it will run. <coughs> so in this case, the path variable, I've got a directory for the grads program, there's a directory for the IDB program, there's a directory for Kitus, uh, there's a directory for NCL, there's a directory for weather, then there's user local bin, then there's slash bin, slash user bin, user bin x11, the gem pack stuff, oh, there's this little dot directory here. Um, it can be unsafe to put the dot directory in your path, but if you're writing scripts or developing programs that are going to be in the directory that you're working on them, it might make sense to have that dot directory there so that the shell looks for it there. Uh, if you don't have that in your path, you might create a script and make sure that it's executable. We'll talk about the permissions in a little bit. But when you try to run it, it says command not found. And you're like, what? It's right here. It's in this directory. Why can't you find it? It's because it's not in your path if you don't have that dot in there. You can get around that with, remember I said there was an example of why you might use a dot slash in a name? If, if, it, if the dot is not in your path and you give it dot in front of it like that dot slash program, then it ignores the path and says run this run, run the one that's in this directory rather than look at the path here. And this rehash thing uh, in TC shell or C shell, it keeps a hash table of all of the programs that it knows about so it doesn't have to go out and look every time. If you change your path, you have to type rehash before it will up, which updates that hash table before it'll actually find so you might be in a state where you've changed your path, but the hash table hasn't updated it, so it still won't find the command that you're looking for where you change the path. You can find out information about where programs are or which one you're using. Uh, there's a command called where is, which will tell you where things are, and there's a which command, which tells you which of those you're actually using. slash bin slash pwp or slash user bin pwp. Uh, but that'll tell you information about where the command is. Sometimes there's multiple versions of a command on the operating system, and this will tell you which one you're actually running. <coughs> when you're running Unix commands, you can enter several of them on a command, one after another, separated by a semicolon. So in this case, this would give you a directory listing and then print out the date. I was talking earlier about pipes where you can take the output from one command and use it as input to another command. Here's an example of that. Um, in this case, it'd be the ls minus ltrf, which is some options to list command that change the behavior of how it lists the file names. Um, I've been around since 30 years, so there's a lot of files in my home directory. If I do an ls minus ltrf, I'm going to get like 300 pages of stuff scrolling by. <clears throat> but maybe I'm only interested in the most recent files. Okay, that's what this does. It does a long listing, it does it in time order, it does a reverse so that the newest files are at the end rather than the beginning, and then the capital F has information about whether it's executable or whether it's a directory or some other things like that. I can pipe it into the tail command, which by default the tail command just shows the last 10 lines of whatever you're running it on. Okay, so <clears throat> in this case, it would be a long listing of my directory but only showing you the last 10 lines of it. Okay, so it, it's easy to take the output from one command, put it as the input into another, like that. Right? And then if you want to run a command in the background where I was trying to show you an example and it failed on you, um, you can put an ampersand after the command and that automatically runs it in the background. So for example, if I'm going to run Firefox from the terminal window and I know I don't need, I don't need it occupying my terminal window anymore, you can type Firefox, space, ampersand, and that runs it in the background. It'll keep running, but it'll give you a terminal. <coughs> okay, uh, getting back through the history, there's a command called history. That's not actually not a uh, abbreviation. But if you type history, it will show all of the previous commands that you've typed with either the time or the number of the command in front of it or both. Um, 
there's various ways to access the, the commands in your history. If you type two exclamation points in a row, it will repeat the command you just did. So whatever command you just ran, it will do again. <coughs> um, you can type exclamation point and then a character string that's long enough to be unique, and it will repeat the previous command that starts with whatever that is. Um, so if I had a ls minus ltr and I did exclamation l, it would rerun the previous version of whatever started with l, which whatever is that command. <coughs> you can access them by number, so when you run the history and it's got all these numbers next to it, um, if you re want to rerun command number 600, you can type exclamation point 600. And it'll rerun whatever command 600 was when you see that in history listing. <coughs> and in the, there's some rudimentary uh, editing available in the C shell. If you type a caret and then some old string on the command that you just ran, and then a caret and then what you want to replace it with, it will run the command that you just ran, substituting new for old. Um, it's, I guess, easier if you see an example of it. But <clears throat> in TC shell, it's actually easier than that. Uh, you can, in TC shell and bash, you can use the arrow keys. So if you use the up arrow key, it will go backwards through your history and show it to you on the, on the command line. The down arrow will go back forwards through your history. When you find a command that you want to run, if you want to edit it, you can use the left and right arrows to move along the command line to edit, to make changes in the backspace and, and change stuff. If you want to take the cursor all the way to the beginning of the line, Rather than using the arrow key and wait for it to scroll over, you can type control A, and that will take you to the beginning of the line. And that works in both TC shell and bash. Uh, control E will take you to the end of the line. So if you want to move the cursor back to the end of the line, control E will do that. Um, one that I don't have on here, but it's kind of useful, is control U will erase the whole line. So if, you're, if you have a bunch of stuff on the line you want to start over, or for example, if you're trying to type your password and you realize it's wrong, rather than hitting the backspace key a bunch of times, you can type control U, and that'll just erase everything and start over at the beginning. <clears throat> and when you're using these command history things, when you go back and edit the commands, you don't actually have to move the cursor to the end of the line to run it. You can have the cursor can still be in the middle of the line. When you hit enter, it'll run the whole command that's on the command line. Okay, <clears throat> when you run a command on Unix, you might be connected to some files or reading data from a file or writing output to a file. <clears throat> Every program on Unix has three places that it either gets data from or puts output to without you doing anything. There's what's called standard input, standard output, and standard error. Standard input <clears throat> is usually the key one. Right? If you run the command and it's looking for input, it's usually going to be you typing at the, at the keyboard. Standard output is usually the screen. If there's output from the program, it's usually going to go scrolling up the terminal window on the screen. Standard error also is usually the screen. And the difference between output and error, standard output is something that you told the program to put a print statement in or something, and it's expected that that output goes there. <clears throat> standard error is what happens when something bad happens, like you divide it by zero or you refer to something that doesn't exist. Or, in other words, not something that you told the program to write out, but something bad happened and it had some information to tell you what that bad thing was. That goes to standard error. And it's usually both the output and the error are on the screen. But you can change these. <clears throat> you can have the program take input from somewhere other than the keyboard, and you can have it put the output or the error into some place other than going to the screen. And in fact, you can have the output and the error go to two different places because they're two different, two different things. <clears throat> the commands in C shell and TC shell, and I think a lot of these work similarly in Bash. Um, the um, putting things, um, well, redirecting the error is a little different in Bash, but <clears throat> the greater than and less than signs and the ampersand signs are the way you redirect the output on, at the command line. So if you do ls, greater than, and then a file, it's going to take the output of the list command and it's going to put it in a file called file, overwriting anything that might have been in there before. <clears throat> Two 
greater than sign and send a row will do the same thing, except it will append at the end of a file. So if you've got a file that has some stuff in it and you want to add on to it, you would use the, the two greater than signs to do that. <clears throat> now that just puts the standard output in here. So if you do this sort of thing and you run it, maybe not with a list command, but with something else, and you have an error, the error is still going to go to the screen in this case, either of these two cases. To write the error to, into the file also, like let's maybe you're running a program and it's going to run for 10 minutes and you want to capture all the output into a file and something bad happened, right? <clears throat> um, if you didn't redirect the error, the output for the program will be in that file, but the error that caused it to fail won't be in the file, it will be on the screen. Um, if you want to put the error messages into the file also, put an ampersand in. So ls greater than ampersand file will put the standard output and error in the file. And similarly, the two greater than signs will append it rather than overwrite. <coughs> Less than is for redirecting standard input. So if you want to do run the list command and have its input come from like a list of file names maybe, uh, you can do ls less than some file with a bunch of files in it, file names in it. Um, and then two less than signs in a row will redirect the standard input up to um, uh, oops, up to a line that has some character string on it. And where we typically will use this in this building is if you're writing with like a gempack script where you run a gempack program, you run set a bunch of variables within the gempack program, and then you actually tell it to run. <clears throat> All of the input to the gempack program, you'd use this greater than or less than, less than, and then some character string at the end, which would you'd say run the Gempack program, taking its input up to some word. Then you have a bunch of lines that tell it what, you, how you want to change its behavior. And then at the very end, you have that word where it's the same string uh, that you use on, on, on where you redirected the output. In this case, this word thing has to be the first and only thing on the line at the end that's up to the standard input at the end of the redirecting of the input. It has to be, the only thing on the line has to be unique within the program. Um, I think I have a gem pack example later on at the very end that will run, that you can run, that shows how you go about doing this. It's probably easier when you see it than just talking about it. Um, pipes, we talked about that already. Aliases, it is possible to write your own commands. So if you find yourself constantly typing something really long, like for example, a lot of times I want to see a long listing of hyphen in the tail, I can create an alias called LT, which when I type LT, it runs this whole thing. And that can be pretty handy if you've got like big path names, you've got to change into a directory that's several deep or whatever. <coughs> in this case, I've got a, a I'm changing directory to slash big time slash poker slash archive all the time. And I made a command called arch, so I can just type arch and it runs this command. You can save yourself a lot of typing <coughs> with aliases. And you can do that for, you know, if, you're, if you have a command, a really complex command that you use to SSH into a machine, um, you can make a really short command that does that. And like I talked to earlier, uh, the line continuation character is backslash. Um, actually, what that that character is, what it does is it removes the special meaning of any other character. So we'll talk a little bit about, for example, an asterisk is a special character that means zero or any number of characters. Um, if you want to have actually type a star or an asterisk, you could put a backslash in front of it, and then it says get rid of the special meaning where asterisk or where the star means everything. It just means the star. Um, you can do that with that, and there's like, other characters that have special meanings that you can get rid of with the, the, the backslash. <clears throat> and the reason why it works as a line continuation character is it removes a special meaning of hitting enter to lower the so. so for example, this is sort of what Professor Morgan was trying to do when he deleted his stuff, except he had a forward slash there. This is a way you could remove a number of files, you know, one per line with a line continuation character at the end. That has to be the last thing on the line. There can't be any spaces or anything after it. Because <clears throat> then it, it's, you're not removing the special meaning of the return key. 
you're removing a special meaning out of space, and then at the end there's actually a return, if that makes any sense. So. Okay, you can write shell scripts like a batch file. Uh, if you have a whole bunch of commands that you want to run always in, in a row, you can do them with just a single command um, at the prompt. So this is an example of a really simple script that says good morning, it tells you what day it is, and reminds me to do everything that I need to do today. That's something you probably wouldn't, this is probably something you wouldn't do, but uh, if you're writing a Gempack program or a Gempack plots, we use them a lot. Um, it's, Gempack can be kind of tricky and there's a lot of setup behind it. Gempack is a weather analysis program for those of you who aren't AOS people. Um, <clears throat> but once you have a program that's working, it's really easy to make a copy of it and just change one or two things and without having to redo the whole thing from scratch. Um, so you can write pretty complicated Gempack scripts that do pretty complicated maps without having to retype it in every time. Okay, now we get into some um, some more commands working with files and directories. Uh, there's a command called cat. If you take a file and you just say cat file, it's going to scroll the contents of that file up the screen to standard output. If you redirect that standard output into a file, it gets put into a file into the file. So this command right here if I say cat into file one, this stuff, and then hit control D to end it, it's going to create a file called file one with this text in it. That's one way of creating a new file. You normally wouldn't do that, normally you'd use an editor. Um, but maybe you have a bunch of files that you want to concatenate together into a single file. This would do that. This cat file one, file two, file three, into file four <coughs> is going to take the contents of file one, two, and three, and put them uh, in order one after another in a single file called file 4. You do have to be a little bit careful when you do that because <clears throat> the order of how this is done matters. It actually creates the new file before it reads the old ones. So if you cat file 1 and file 2 back into file 1, it's going to overwrite the original contents of file 1 before it has a chance to read them. So you would end up in this case with just the contents of file 2 in file one and file whatever used to be in file one is going to be over there. So you have to kind of careful that. Uh, there's a command called echo, which will echo whatever is after it to stand it out. <coughs> um, that's useful if you're writing uh, shell scripts, just to give yourself an idea of you know, what, where you are in the script or what's being done. Um, in this case, if I take echo and then this text will be put into file one and I redirect that output into file one, now I'm going to have a file called file uh, one with this text in it. Um, and then I could append to that file with the two great event signs that we were doing before. There's a command called touch. Uh, if you touch a file, if the file doesn't exist, it's going to create a new file, but there's be nothing in it. It's just an empty file with that name. If the file does exist and you touch it, it's just going to update the modification time to be null from whatever. Okay, so that was a couple of kind of rudimentary ways of creating a file. Normally you would use a text editor if you're going to create a new file. Um, a text editor compared to a word processor, so you're probably familiar with like Microsoft Word or OpenOffice Writer or something like that. Um, those are, are programs that allow you to make like bold text and italics and like make it look nice. <clears throat> a text editor doesn't have all of that stuff. All it does is edit the text. It's just no, no uh, bells and whistles. Um, there's a bunch of them that are available. Just about every Unix system that you sit down in front of is going to have an editor called VI. Uh, it stands for Visual, <coughs> or VIM, which is an improved version of it. Uh, there's other ones, Nedit, Gedit. Um, those are um, X Windows based editors that you need to be sitting in front of an X terminal like this to run. Uh, Nano, or Pico, or Emacs. Are other text editors that you can use. Emacs will work either on a X Windows mode or on a command, just text mode. Uh, Nano and Pico are text only editors, so they'll just edit in a, uh, in a terminal window or if you're remotely logged onto a system, you want to use one of those. So just start a, uh, to start editing a file in VI, you type VI and then the file name. If the file exists, it'll load that file into the editor, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about VI at the end. 
Um, if the file doesn't exist, it'll open up an empty file, and then there are ways that you can start adding text and typing in that file. Similarly, uh, nedit or gedit or any of these other things, if you just run the editor name and then the file name, and if you want to put it in the background, put an ampersand after it, um, that will open the file in the editor. Um, yeah, so I already said most of this. Um, BI, it's a, it's a pretty cryptic editor. There's a pretty steep learning curve to knowing how to use it. But once you do know how to use it, it saves you a lot. You don't have to use the mouse at all. You use your just your fingers on the keyboard to move the cursor around or change words or do everything. Um, so you don't have to be moving your, your hands around all the time. It's really, you can get a lot done with it. Um, and edit is kind of like Notepad on Windows or Text Edit on a Mac. Gedit is another version of that. Um, these two are both character-based text editors. Um, they're a little less cryptic than BI. In other words, use the arrow keys to go up and down and move and down and stuff like that. Um, control characters to, to save or, or exit or things like that. <clears throat> and then Emacs is it's pretty powerful. Um, there's a lot you can do with it, but it's kind of overkill if you're just using it as a text editor. Some people live by it. There's kind of a religious war between people between you know, what's a better editor, BI or Emacs. Okay, a bunch more commands. Uh, looking at the contents of a file, we talked about it earlier, the cat stands for concatenate, and you can cat a file and it will scroll the contents of that file up the screen. There are pagers that are <coughs> that exist. One of them is called more, uh, another one is called less, and those will show you one screen full of text of the file at a time. So if you type less in the file, it'll show you one screen's worth. You hit the space bar, then the next screen will just eventually scroll up and then <clears throat> if you do know VI uh, as an editor, the commands that you use to move around in the file will also work with less. The same commands you can use to go forward or back and things like that. Um, obviously, you can use a text editor to look at a file. Uh, there's a command called head, which displays by default the first 10 lines of a file. If you just want to look at the very top of a file without actually putting it in an editor, uh, you can use head. There's an option of a number, so if you head minus 20, for example, it will show you the first 20 lines. If you head minus 100, it will show you the first 100 lines. That's probably what you want to see because it will scroll on the screen. <clears throat> and there's probably other options for the head command. You can check the main page for it if you want to see it there. Uh, tail shows the last, by default, 10 lines of a file. Um, you can do tail minus 20, it will show you the last 20 lines. The minus F option means first in, first out. And what that means is it'll show you the last 20 lines of the file, but then if anything gets appended to it later, it will continue showing you that uh, as it gets appended to it. <clears throat> so for example, if I'm running a computer model, a lot of times I'll redirect the output into a file, and as the computer model runs along, it puts information about each time step in the file. If I did tail minus 20 F on that file, or F20, I can kind of monitor the progress of that as it moves along. As, as the file gets added to, that stuff will scroll up the screen as well. Does that make sense? Any? No, no questions? Everybody's either falling asleep or following along? Okay. Um, okay, the directory listing. Uh, we talked about it a little bit earlier. It's ls. If you type ls in a directory, it will show you the files that are in that directory. It doesn't show you any hidden files, which anything that starts with a dot, so the dot and dot dot directories are two files that start with a, a period. Um, the startup files, there, there are maybe other files in your in the directory that start with a dot. They won't be shown with a normal ls command. <clears throat> you can use the minus a option to the list command to see those files. You can use the minus l, that's an l, not a one. Ls minus L and then a file will show you some a longer version of the listing and give you more information about it. These are permissions and we'll talk about those in a bit. Um, this is who owns it, this is the group that owns it, this is how big it is, when it was last created, the last, last access modified, and then the file name itself. There's about two dozen options to the ls command that you can use to modify how the output from the listing looks. You know, whether you get one file per line by itself or whether it writes in like a paragraph form. I'm not going to go through all those. You can look at the main page and see what the different options are. 
<coughs> copying files, if you want to make a copy of a file, uh, it's the CP command. And you can copy file one to file two. That does like what you think. It makes a copy of file one, now I'm to file two. If you copy a file to a directory, it makes a copy of that file with the same name, but in the, in the directory dir1. Um, you can copy multiple files at a time into a directory. So if you copy file one, file two, file three, into directory one, it'll make copies of all three of those files in directory one. If directory one, if this thing is not a directory, it'll complain to you and say, sorry, you can't copy multiple files to something that's not the directory. <coughs> Moving or renaming files. Uh, if you move a file one to file two, it will rename it. If you move file one to a directory, it moves that file into directory one. And again, just like with the copy command, you can move a bunch of files at once into the directory. <clears throat> Deleting files with the remove command, rm. Uh, if you remove file one, it will delete it. Be careful, there is no recycle bin or trash can. Usually on Unix, if you delete a file, it's gone. Um, unless you have, have a backup of it. <clears throat> Sometimes it's nice because of that to use the minus I option where it'll ask you for confirmation. Do you really want to remove this file? So it kind of gives you a, a second chance of being like, oh wait, that's not the file I want to delete. But this will delete those three files and ask you for each one to make sure you want to do it. This minus I flag for confirmation works with the copy command and move command also so you don't accidentally overwrite something. It'll ask you before you have a chance to overwrite. Any questions about that? That's like basic how to copy, move, delete files. <clears throat> the diff command can be helpful if you've got, you know, if you have a shell script that's working and you make a copy of it, you change, make some changes, and now it's not working anymore. You can use the diff command to find out what's different between the two, and maybe that'll help you figure out what you changed that's causing it to fail. So, for example, if I have one file where line one is the same and line two is not the same. And I have a file called file2 where line 1 is the same and line 2 is different. If I run a diff on those two files, I'm going to get output that looks like this, where it's going to say, the first file had a line that looked like this, and the second file had a line that looked like that, and they're different. It will go through the whole file and have sections of where they're different and what's different about them. And that can be useful for, <coughs> for comparing files without having to go through and try to visually look at what's different. GREP stands for General Regular Expression Program. Uh, that is a program that allows you to search the contents of files. <coughs> so the general uh, syntax of that is to say GREP, some expression, and then a bunch of files. It will look in all those files for expression, and that's case sensitive. So that will look for capital expression in any of these files. So if you know you've got a file that has a password, you shouldn't probably, but if you did, you could grab on password in a bunch of files, and it will show you a listing of what files uh, have that. And I think it actually shows you the line in the file where that string occurs. <clears throat> you could make that case insensitive with a minus i. So in this case, it would find capital expression, lowercase expression, or any combination of that in those files. And again, there's a, a whole language in terms of how you can create this expression that I'm not going to get into today. It's pretty complicated, but you can do some pretty elegant stuff in terms of searching for s types of things in files. Um, there's a sort command if you want to sort a file alphabetically or numerically or in reverse order. Um, so there's the sort command for that. Again, I'll let you look at the main page if you want to figure out how to use it. <coughs> OK, file permissions. On Unix and Linux, there are three people. There's you, there's the group that you're in, and there's everybody else. <clears throat> okay, so when you look at, um, when you do a long listing, and there was that thing up at the beginning, I don't know if I can get back to it. This stuff over here has to do with permissions. This first character will be a dash if it's a file, it'll be a D if it's a directory, It'll be a C or a B if it's one of those special files, like a disk file or whatever. Then there's three groups of three characters, RWX, RWX, RWX. 
and they stand for read, write, and execute permission for the user, the group that you're in, and everybody else. Okay, so there's a couple of different ways that you can change a permission. When you first create a file or a directory, it will have a default permission assigned to it, and you can change what that default is. Um, but by default, it will have a certain permission. Usually, it ends up being readable and executable. Is that right? It might be readable and writable by you, and then readable by other people, uh, your group and, and others. But you can use the chmod command, chmode, <coughs> to change the permissions to either allow or remove access to any of those groups of people. So this syntax here in the chmod, U is for user, G is for your group, O is for everybody else, and A is for all, in other words, user, group, and others, everybody. Plus would add the access, minus would remove the access, and then R for read, W for write, and X for execute permission. So you get chmod, A plus X, and then some file. That would give everybody execute permission on that file. Um, there's also a numeric way of doing it, where you can give it a three-digit number, where that number is the sum of four for read permission, two for write permission, and one for execute permission. So if I did a chmod 761 on a file, seven is four plus two plus one, so I'd get read, write, and execute permission for the user. Six is four plus two, so I'd get read and write, but not execute permission for the group, and one is execute, so you have just execute permission for everybody else, but they couldn't read it or make any modifications to it. Um, this UMass command is what's used to create the default permissions, and you can change that in your startup files. Um, that is a three-digit number that's subtracted from 666 for files or 777 for directories. Usually the default UMass is 022, which means you as a user get read, write, and execute permission um, for a directory. Um, and then other people would have read and execute but not write permission. For a file, you'd subtract that from, from 666, so you'd end up with read and write but not execute permission for you on a file. Read permission, uh, read permission, is that right? Uh, yeah, read permission for the group and the others, but not write or execute. So <clears throat> read permission on a file means you have the ability to look at the contents of that file. Write permission means you have the ability to modify the contents or delete that file. And execute permission means you have the permission to run that file as a program. So if you write a shell script, <coughs> Usually when you first create it, it's not going to have execute permission. You need to chmod either u plus x or a plus x to add execute permission on that. Then you'd be able to, to run it as a program. A lot of people uh, starting out will have that issue where they'll create a shell script and they'll go to run it and they'll say permission denied. You're like, what do you mean? I just, it's my file. Why can't I run it? <clears throat> and it's because you don't have execute permission. So, any questions on permissions? Um, it can be a little confusing. I usually find myself using this, um, sorry, this method. It just it makes more sense to me. But either of them. Um, <clears throat> for a directory, read permission means the ability to look at what's in the directory, I think. Write permission means the ability to modify or uh, delete files that are in the directory. <clears throat> and execute permission, as far as I remember, has to do with the ability to change into that directory. You can't CD into a directory if you don't have execute permission. But you might be able to list the contents of it, which is kind of weird. Anyways. Okay, some of these other special characters that I was saying that the backslash can remove the special meaning of. Um, an asterisk, when you're, like, if you want to give a, a like, a a template for file names. <clears throat> An asterisk will match zero or any zero or more of any characters. A question mark will match exactly one character of, of anything there. Um, you can put a sequence of letters in brackets, and it will match exactly one of any of the characters that's in those brackets. So in this case, it would be a capital J or lowercase J. 
you could put any number of characters in there and it would match any of those case sensitive, any of those characters that are in there in that position in the file name. <clears throat> you could do ranges, so like this would match any of one, two, three, four, or five. But um, tilde is a special character that expands to your home directory. If you put a username after it, it'll expand to the home directory of that person. So if I wanted to change it to uh, Mark's home directory, I could say CD space tilde Mark, and it would change, it would expand into their home directory wherever that is. So like yours would change into my home directory. There's a program called File, which will tell you the file type if it knows about it. So in this case, I can tell if that's a PostScript document. If you're trying to find a file in a path where you're at, you can use find. Uh, the, the syntax for the find command is a little bit weird, but it's really powerful if you want to delete every file that is .text or you know, delete any file bigger than a certain size. Or there's all kinds of stuff that you can do with it. You can look at the man page to figure out. But, um, the general syntax is find. What path do you want to look under? Um, and then in this case, anything with a file of, of that file name, and then it'll just print that file and path name to it. Um, you can you can do more than just print. You can delete things. You can change the mod. You can basically run any command you want on the list of files that it finds. <coughs> so here's an example. If I want to find all of the text files in this directory, let's say find slash user slash people slash poker with any name star.text and print it. So that would find any files with anything, including nothing, dot text, and just print the name of those files uh, in the path to them. So that can be pretty handy. <coughs> Symbolic links, um, that's like a pointer to a file. So um, one place where I would use those, uh, sometimes there's like a really big data file, but I want everybody in the class to have access to that data file. Rather than making a copy of a big data file in all of their directories, I could make a symbolic link in their directory that points to the actual file somewhere else on the list. And so everybody could have a symbolic link and pointing at that file, but that's <clears throat> there's only one actual copy of the file taking up space. Uh, the downside of a symbolic link is if you delete the original file, the link might still be there, but now it's not pointing at anything. It's a broken. There's actually, there's what's also called hard links. I don't think I talked about that in the PowerPoint at all, but a hard link is another file name that actually is connected to the same data on the disk. And the actual file doesn't get deleted until all of the hard links go away. So if you had a file named file one, and you made, if you said ln file one to file two, it's gonna make a hard link. So that then you're gonna have something called file one <coughs> and something called file two, which are both the same physical data on the disk, right? If you edit file one, file two gets changed, but also it's the same file. If you remove file one, but file two is still there, the file isn't actually gone, because there's still one hard link that's connected to it. Um, and then if you delete file two, then it would actually no longer have any, any links to it. Printing files from the command line, uh, usually you only want to print text or postscript files, although under Linux they've got filters that you can print images and other things as well. Um, LPR is the command to, to print, so LPR minus P in the printer name on the file. LPQ will show you what's in the queue. Um, <coughs> you can find the ID number from that LPQ command and use LPRM to delete it if you want to get rid of it. Uh, sometimes the command to print is LP instead of LPR. Usually you're not going to be doing that. Usually you're going to be printing from a, a GUI, you know, just a file print kind of thing. But if you have a file and you want to just print it without opening it or anything, you can do that. Um, if you print a file and it doesn't come out of the printer, there is a queuing system on Linux and sometimes that goes down. So it might be paused or there might be the way the printer was down and it shut everything down. <clears throat> if you're in here or in this building and you try to, in the department, and you print something and it doesn't print, let me know because usually I can fix it. If I don't know that there's a problem, then it'll just be there forever. Nobody will be able to print it. That's kind of fun. Um, in this building, or in, on this floor, 
There's two printers in here. There's a black and white printer called GPN. There's a color printer called Prism. They're both in the back over there. There's also printers next to my office in that conference room. Uh, the black and white one is called Synoptic. The color one is called Chroma. And those should be set up on all of these computers in here. Uh, if you have a laptop and you're in our building and you need to print something on it, There's a number of different commands that you can use to compress files losslessly so that you can save space. Uh, it doesn't actually change the file, it just puts it in the more compressed format you can get it back. Usually you'll see stuff with a .gz and that means it's been gzipped. If you gzip a file and it'll compress it and add a .gz on the end of it, gunzip will uncompress that and give it back to the original name. Um, the older version, there was a compress and uncompress, there was pack and unpack. There's a newer compression uh, called bzip2. So if you find get file names that end in .gz, .z, .bz, that's what they are. They're, they're compressed files, and you can uncompress those files. <coughs> moving machines around, or moving files around from one machine to another. In the olden days, like in the early days of the internet, everything was unencrypted and clear text on the internet. And there was a program called Telnet for connecting from one machine to another. <clears throat> and there was a program called FTP for transferring files from one machine to another. Everything was unencrypted. The password went across unencrypted. The file went across unencrypted. <clears throat> and anybody who happened to be listening to the internet on that you know, could see that information go by and get your password. But in the early days of the internet, there was like five military sites. And that was it. Like, who cares, right? Everybody knows. There's no bad guys yet on the internet. <clears throat> now there's a lot of bad guys, and you probably want to make sure that you're not sending passwords around unencrypted. So I wouldn't recommend using FTP, but a lot of times it is. Uh, there's a way you can use it as anonymous. If you've got files that you want to make available to anybody, you can put them up on an FTP server and let people log in and anonymously grab them. Um, so that's about the only time you use FTP anymore. The syntax would be FTP and then the machine that you want to connect to. <clears throat> Log in with the username and password. If you use anonymous as a username, if the server allows anonymous, you can type whatever you want as a password. Usually they ask for your email address, but you can put in whatever. <clears throat> you can CD to a directory. Um, sometimes you want to make sure that, it, um, that it's either binary or ASCII, depending on the kind of data that you're transferring and where you're the kinds of machines you're transferring from to. You can either put a file from like a local file to a remote file, or you can get a remote file to a local file, and when you're all done, you can type by. Um, so that's sort of briefly how you use FTP. Um, <clears throat> SCP is a better option because it does encrypt your password and all of the data that's being moved around. Um, so if, you, if you're working in here, and you want to copy some images that you created back to your laptop or to another Unix machine, you can use SCP. The general syntax is your S SCP, <clears throat> what you want to copy from, what you want to copy to. So in this case, I'm copying a local file on this machine called file name to my username at some remote machine, colon, and then the path to where I want to put it. Okay, so that's what I'm copying from, that's what I'm copying to. If you want to copy a file from a remote machine to this machine, you'd switch it around. So I'm in that case, SCP, username, at remote, colon, the path. So that is the full path name to the file on the remote machine, and then a dot would put it in the current directory that I'm in. In other words, that's where you use that dot directory. You can use wildcards, so if I want to copy all of the text files to a, some other machine, um, I could SCP start up text and have to put it in quotes in that case. Um, uh, and then that would put it to another machine. So that's a way of, of moving files from one machine to another. Um, SFTP, it looks like F a lot of people are used to the syntax of FTP, so they don't understand. SCP, so SFTP, it looks like FTP, it works like FTP, but it's actually running SCP underneath the hood. So there's some FTP clients for, secure FTP clients for Windows. Yeah. 
directories. Um, real quickly, mkdir if you want to make a directory, mv if you want to move or rename a directory, works similarly to files. If you ls the content, it'll, if you ls on a directory name, it'll show you the names of the files that are in that directory. Um, copy will copy a directory, so if you copy minus recursively directory one and directory two, it'll take all the files and directories in directory one. It will copy, it will create a directory two and move those, copy those files in there. Or it'll copy all of the files from directory one into directory two if directory two didn't exist. It'll make a directory two of having files. If directory two did exist, it's just going to make a copy of directory one and its subdirectories in there. So you'll either get, if directory two did not exist, you'll get a copy of what was directory one in directory two. If directory two did exist, there's now going to be a directory called dir one in directory two that had all the same files. Um, remove directory. Uh, we'll remove a directory, it has to be empty. Uh, remove minus r, the file command remove for the recursive option of directory one will delete that directory and all of the files in it. So if you want to get rid of a directory and all the files, uh, rm space minus r. pwd, we talked about earlier, that displays the path to the directory that you're in. <coughs> okay, any questions about that stuff so far? Okay, environment variables are used to change the behavior of the shell or tell a program where to look for data files or various things like that. Um, you can echo dollar sign and then the variable name and it will show you what that variable is set to. In C shell, you set an environment variable with the setnv command, so set n, capital bar. Usually these environment variables are capital, all capital letters. <coughs> as opposed to shell variables, which are usually lowercase, and we'll get to those in a second. Um, so this would be how you'd set a variable in a C shell or TC shell. In the born shell, it would be something like this, where you set the variable and then export it. <coughs> in bash and in K shell, you can export the value right in one command, so export bar equals something. So this thing and that are equivalent for C shell and bash. If you just type env, it will print out all of the different variables that you have set. You can see what those are. Some common variables. Uh, display is an environment variable that tells where to put the X windows display. And usually it's the monitor that you're sitting in front of, which doesn't have to be. Editor would be your default text editor. Pager would be your default pager, whether that's more or less or something else. <coughs> Path is where the uh, shell looks for programs. Printer would be if you want to set a default printer. Shell gets set when you log in, and that has the value of whatever shell you're using, so it could be TCSH or bash. Term tells you the type of terminal that you're using, and TZ will tell you what time zone you're using. What time zone you're using. Uh, a couple others that we sometimes see here, NetCDF, a lot of times will be an environment variable telling you where to look for NetCDF, is NetCDF installation. Um, load library path will tell it where to look for shared libraries if it's not in the system default place where it would normally look. Similarly for MATLAB, uh, NCARG root is an environment variable if you're using NCARG graphics or NCL, telling you where that install is. <coughs> okay, so those were environment variables. These are shell variables, and they're specific to just the shell that you're in. Um, again, you can echo that the dollar sign of the variable, and they're usually lowercase. For C shell or TC shell, you set those with set. The variable name equals some value, and then it'll be a string value. If you want it to be a numeric value, so you can do arithmetic operations on it, you use an at sign to set it. So at i equals 5 sets i to be a shell variable that's a number that you can actually add or subtract or multiply or whatever. Um, in bash, there's a similar syntax. You say set var, and then the variable. Uh, I think those are all string variables. I don't, I'm not sure if there's a way to make them numeric in bash. <clears throat> and if you type set, that will show the variables, the, the values of all of the, I should say, shell variables, not variables. And again, they're used to set, set shell-specific preferences. Uh, and they're usually only in the shell. 
<clears throat> when you first log in, a lot of stuff gets set. Your app gets set, your default printer might get set. Uh, all of that stuff happens in, um, in startup files. And it's usually, uh, and this, this works for shells, but there's other programs that also use startup files, and it's usually dot, and then the name of the program, rc. So like the CSH startup files, that's CSH, rc. TC shell is that TCSHRC, although because it's a modified C shell, it will read the TC or the CSH if TCSHRC doesn't exist. Um, that login is a similar one that only gets executed once when you first log in. So there may be some things that you only want to happen if it's a login shell if you're actually sitting in front of it rather than running the background. <coughs> For the born shell and the K shell, it's a file called .profile. And for bash, it's going to be either .bashrc or typically in here it's .bash underscore profile. And I usually symbolically those two things together so that you can edit one or the other in the same file. <clears throat> this is an example of what a, dot, what a startup file might look like, .cshrc. This checks to see what my operating system is. This is from way back when we used to have Irix or Sun machines up here. Uh, and I don't do anything there if it's Linux. Then I do some Linux things. This sets that default permission that gets subtracted from 777 or 666. Uh, you can change that there. This limits core dump sizes. Sometimes if you're running a program and it crashes, it'll dump a core file. And if it's a really big model or something, those core files can be huge and fill up your disk. So this says don't do that, make them zero. Uh, this is a section where it's setting the path. Um, and this is a C shell syntax of setting the path. <clears throat> setting some environment variables here for Anchor to root and the grads directory. Here's sourcing a file uh, to get some other environment stuff for Gempad, telling it to use uh, to, to only keep the last 32 commands in my history. Here's making a couple of aliases, changing my prompt to be something else. There's all kinds of stuff that you can put in there. <clears throat> it's good. If you're messing with your startup files, to have more than one window open at a time, because it is possible to make changes to your startup files that break things, that all of a sudden you can't log in anymore because something's not right. Um, usually, you can get on as administrator and fix that. But if you have a window that's open already, those files have already been run. So if you're if you're messing with your startup files, it's good to have more than one connection at a time in case you mess it up. Now that you can't get back in. A bunch more commands. Clear will clear your screen. DF is a useful command that tells you how much disk space is available on the different file systems. DU will show you the size of the disk size of the things in the directory you run it. There's a bunch of options for that. Um, here's a nice one. If you do DU minus SK star <clears throat> and you pipe it into sort minus NR, it'll show the disk usage in kilobytes for each file and directory sorted by size with the largest first, so you can see where the big, where the space is being taken up. Uh, script, if you want to, like, let's say you're doing something and having a problem and you want to show me what you did in the output from all the programs so that I can help you figure out what's wrong. If you type script, it will capture everything that you type and all the output from what you type or from the programs that you run into a file name, and the default is TypeScript, is the name of the file, until you type exit. So all everything that goes scrolling by the screen will be captured into a file by the script area until you type exit. <clears throat> and that could be useful for just getting the output of programs or whatever. Um, source, if you source a file, it will execute the contents of the file as if they were typed at the prompt. So if you make a change, for example, to your .tcshrc file and you want it to apply right now rather than waiting until time you log in, you can source your .tcshrc file and it executes all of that right now and makes it apply uh, to the shell that you're right that you're in now. TAR is a program that was used a long time ago to write uh, archives up to tape. Now it's mostly used for like distributions. If you've got a, a, a program that you want to distribute to you know, source code that you want to send to somebody or you want to make a, a backup of a directory that has a bunch of files in it, you can use tar to do that. Um, SSH is the command that you use to connect to from one machine to another. Um, it's kind of like SCP we were talking about before. So you SSH, 
to the machine that you want to connect to minus L in your username, or you can just type SSH, your username, at, or whatever. So, like for example, cat3 that we were talking about earlier, you could SSH your username at cat3.aos.edu. It will connect and ask you for your password and then log you in. <clears throat> Again, you'd use a minus X or a minus Y to tunnel the X Windows stuff if you're going to be doing X Windows graphics. There's a command who or W that will give you information about other people that have logged into the machine. There's a whole bunch of other commands. Uh, Cal is kind of handy. That shows you a calendar, and you can give it a year. It will show you a calendar for the whole year. Date will tell you what time, what date and time it is, or you can set the date and time if it's wrong. Um, host name you can set or display the machine host name. OD is kind of an interesting command. If you want to look at the contents of a file, not in ASCII, but in some other you know, base, base 2 or base uh, 16 or whatever, uh, sometimes with data files, that can be helpful. Different compilers, usually CC or GCC for the C compiler, usually capital CC or G++ for the C++ compiler. There's a whole variety of Fortran compilers, depending on what you might have installed in your machine. <clears throat> There's a free one that's available called G Fortran. Uh, it does a pretty good job for most of the stuff. You might see Perl, you might use Python. There's a whole other uh, web page that I have. If, you, if you're using Python, I recommend the Miniconda distribution and Conda Forge to get all your stuff. And there's a web page that I've been pointing to to explain. Usually, with that, everybody installs their own version of it, and they have access to make changes to make create environments or install modules or whatever. There's the Java compiler if you're using that. Um, Make is a, uh, it's, it's not really a compiler, but it has recipes for how to build stuff, how to make things from source code. Mail, I'm not going to talk about, you can always going to use probably a web browser for email or your phone. <coughs> um, Postgres processing, um, if a file ends in .ps, it's a Postgres file. Um, there's a number of different commands that you can use to preview them. You can print them with LPR. Tech and LaTeX, NROF and TROF. Uh, they're uh, document processing languages that you can use in one of those on occasion. Um, to read a PDF file, usually you'd use either XPDF or in, in here it's a program called Events. Or you can just open it in a web browser using really Chrome or Firefox to open the PDF files. A bunch of various things for image and movie processing. PBM Plus or NetPBM is a bunch of conversion programs that will convert from various image types into this <coughs> portable bitmap format. There's like grayscale or a bitmap, which is either black and white, or grayscale or color um, files, and then you can convert from that format into other stuff. So it's sort of a two-step process, <coughs> but you can go from just about any graphics format to just about any other graphics format with the PBM stuff in between. There's also a set of programs called Image Magic, which are really useful for doing conversion or display of images. FFmpeg is a tool that's used to create movies or animations, um, like the stuff I do with our rooftop cameras where I make the time lapse, that's all done using FFmpeg. <coughs> XV and GIMP are image viewers. GIMP is uh, the one I was talking about earlier, it's like Photoshop. VLC is an open source movie viewer that is installed in here, and Xanum is an older uh, movie viewer as well. <clears throat> For web browsing, you're not going to come in uh, on a Linux machine, you're not going to find Internet Explorer or Edge or Safari. Those are Windows or Mac specific things. Uh, Firefox is usually the default browser, and Google Chrome is available also. There's also a couple of text based uh, web browsers that are available, and they can be helpful. For accessibility, in terms of like how is my website looking at a screen reader, um, you can use links with a Y or links L I P S to, to look at that. A variety of different tools and packages that we use here. I guess I won't go through them all. You probably learned about them in the class. Um, here's an example Gempack script. There's if you log in on these machines or if you are later, you can copy this thing into your home directory, make sure it's executable, and then run it. And if you're lucky, it should create a map of the 850 millibar potential temperature and sea level pressure with this name where that's today's date. 
Um, you can look at the contents of that file to see how you might create a Gemback script and then you can modify it to look at other variables or other models or that kind of thing. So there's a sample there for you. <coughs> This uh, is where you can get the mini conda distribution of Python. Um, and I have a web page that I think I, it's a page or two after this that I wrote that explains why I recommend that version of Python, how to install it, how to create environments, uh, uh, do a lot of stuff with that. Um, here would be one way that you would create an environment. Um, Got to use bash for it, it doesn't work in TCSA. So if you're in here and you're using the TC shell, run bash first, and then you can run all the Python stuff. <clears throat> this would activate, uh, usually it's conda activate, and then the environment name. If you want to deactivate that environment, go back to the base, conda deactivate. This is the web page that I wrote that has information about how to install Python, um, how to create environments. It also has information if you want to be able to install and run Python on a Unix server, but view it using a web browser on your computer rather than a web browser on the server. There's a way you can do that. Um, there's some information there about how to set that up. So, <clears throat> that's the introduction to Unix and Linux. Uh, there's a web page that I have here that has links to some other information if you want to dig deeper. Uh, there's only so much I can talk about in two hours. Uh, a lot of this came from a document called Unix is a four-letter word and VI is a two-letter abbreviation, which is kind of funny because Unix is a four-letter word and we can take off at it. And VI is a two-letter abbreviation because everything in Unix is an abbreviation. <clears throat> There's also one called Unix Help for Users. Um, those are both linked on there. The tldr.org uh, has a great introduction to Unix and some more advanced stuff as well that you can look at. Um, so that's the Unix part of it. I can go through VI in about 15 minutes. If you gotta go, go. If you have any questions, please ask me questions. Or if there's like something about what you've been working on that doesn't make sense, you're wondering why I'm happy to talk to you about it. So give a second for those who are heading out, not interested in the VI stuff to plug out. But for those of you who want to see it, it's about eight slides or ten slides. Come and go put this up along. Yep. All right. So VI. Yeah, every Unix system that you ever run into is going to have the VI in it. It might be if it's a Linux system, it's going to be VIM, which has a little more uh, utility to it. When you're using the VI editor, there's two different ways, two different modes of keyboard input. In other words, when you type a key, either it puts that character in the file or it does something else. <clears throat> okay, when you first start the VI editor, it starts up in what's called command mode. And in that mode, all of the keys have functions and they do something other than typing that character into the file. You might be copying a file, you might be moving around in the file, you might be saving it, that sort of thing. <clears throat> and then the other mode is called input mode. In that mode, it does what you would expect. When you type an L, it puts an L in the file. When you type a period, it puts a period in the file. <clears throat> and there are certain keys in command mode that will move you, that will put you in into input mode. I'll talk about some of those in a second. <clears throat> when you're in input mode and you want to go back to command mode, you can hit the escape key. And if you hit the escape key and you don't need to, if you're already in command mode and you hit the escape key, Either the computer will beep or it will flash, a little visual beep. <clears throat> you can usually tell new people that are learning how to use VI because they're beeping all the time, because they hit the escape key when they don't need to. It doesn't hurt, it's, it doesn't cause any problem. It's just if you didn't need to hit escape and you did, it would be better. So don't freak out about that. <clears throat> uh, starting VI, you can VI in a file name. If the file name didn't already exist, you'll see a blank screen with a bunch of tildes down the left hand side. And that just lets you know that the file is empty, or mainly where the bottom is. If you get to the bottom of a file and there's lines below it, they'll have a tilde at the, end, the beginning of it, but there's actually nothing there. <clears throat> when you first start VI, it starts in command mode. And there are certain characters that will put it in certain mode. So when you first start up, it's in command mode. All of the keys will do something different. <clears throat> so when you're in insert mode, 
VI does what you think. Characters that you type are inserted in the file, backspace or delete will erase characters, and escape gets you back into command mode. So it always gets you back into command mode. Command mode is where you do everything else. And the command, like I said, the keys that normally would insert characters now have different functions. <clears throat> so for example, in a file, if you press a lowercase h, it will move the cursor one character to the left from where it was. If you press move J, if you press a J, it moves the cursor one line down. K moves the cursor one line up, and L moves the cursor one line to the right. And those are all kind of like right where your hands normally sit, right? Your fingers normally on the J, you can J and K up and down. It, it's pretty convenient because it's right where your fingers normally are, is where you do to, to move the cursors. You don't have to move your hand, get the arrow keys, move back. <clears throat> Some other uh, keystrokes for moving around. If you press a zero, like the number zero, that will move the cursor to the beginning of whatever line you're on. If you type a dollar sign, so shift four, dollar sign will move the cursor to the end of the current line that you're on. <clears throat> a capital G will move the cursor to the last, the beginning of the last line of the file, all the way to the end of the file. And if you give a number argument, a lot of these things too, a lot of these characters, you can put a numeric argument in front of it, and it'll do whatever it is that many times. So for example, if you want to move the cursor to the top of the file, you can type 1 G, and it says that means go to line 1. You can go to line 10, you can type 10 G, with no space in between, just 1, 0 G. <clears throat> that works with these other commands too. If you said 10 H, it'll move the cursor 10 characters to the left, or 10 characters up or down. <clears throat> Some other ways of moving around the file, if you type Control F, that will move forward or down one full screen, so your, your screen will update with the text from one screen down below. Control V is the opposite, that will go back or up one full screen. If you do Control D, that's for down, it will move forward one half of the screen, and Control U will move up or back one half of the screen. So those are pretty convenient ways of getting through the file more quickly than one line at a time. <clears throat> if you try to move the cursor somewhere that the eye doesn't want you to move, for example, if you're already in the first column and you press an H to move to the left, there is no more left, you can't go any farther left. It will either beep or flash your terminal or somehow let you know that, hey, you can't do that. If you're at the last line of a, of a file and you try to go down a line, there is no line to go to, so it will <clears throat> Okay, well, here are some characters that will put you in insert mode. So a lowercase i will put you in insert mode and start inserting text right before the cursor. So it will start pushing any of the data that you're on over to the right and start typing at that, that, uh, <clears throat> that position. A capital I will start inserting, put you in insert mode and start inserting text before the first character of the line. So we do a capital I and move the cursor from wherever it is to the beginning of the line and put you in insert mode at the beginning of the line. <clears throat> An A is kind of like I, except in start, instead of putting the text before the cursor, you start putting text after the cursor. So whatever whatever character the cursor is on, if you hit an I, if, if your cursor is here and you hit an I, it'll start typing before the A. If you hit, if your cursor is here and you type an A, it'll start typing after. <clears throat> and similarly, a capital A will take you to the, so it'll start appending text at the end of the line, of whatever line you're on. <clears throat> A lowercase o will put you in insert mode and open a new line below the current line that you're on. A capital O will do the same thing, but the line will be above the line that you're currently on. Does that all make sense? Deleting text. If you type a lowercase x, it will delete the character that the cursor is sitting on. <clears throat> you can give that a numeric argument too, so you can delete 10 characters starting with the cursor, the character that the cursor is on. <clears throat> Two D's in a row, DD, -D, will delete the line that the cursor is on. Um, you could give that a numeric argument too, so if you wanted to delete this line and the two below it, you could say three DD and it will delete three lines starting with the line the cursor is on. 
<coughs> and there's a whole lot of other ways you can do it. You can you could say D capital G and it would delete from the line that you're on to the end of the file where the capital G is the end of the file. Um, all kinds of ways that you can mess around with this. <coughs> okay, for saving and quitting. This means you have to be in command mode, so if you were in insert mode, you'd have to hit escape to get back out to command mode. If you type colon w, it will write the contents of the file to the disk. <clears throat> when you first open a file in VI, it opens up a temporary copy of it, and all of the modifications are made to that copy. If you really mess the file up bad, I mean, a lot of times when you're first learning how to use VI, people make mistakes and it gets all you know, messed up beyond recognition. You can bail out of it and the original file is still there. You haven't actually made any changes to the file <coughs> until you write it out. Colon W will save the, cop the temporary copy to the original. If you say colon WQ, it will write the file out and then exit the editor, Q for quit. <coughs> uh, and it writes out the file regardless of whether you've changed it or not. Um, <coughs> two Z's in a row, if you type capital Z, capital Z, it will write the file to disk and exit, but if you haven't made any changes to it, it'll just exit. It won't actually change the modification time of the file. It won't write it out. And <clears throat> if you get to a point where you've messed up a file beyond all repair and you want to bail out and start over, colon Q exclamation point it will quit the editor without writing to the disk. So if you made any changes to it, it'll just abandon any of those changes and just exit the editor. Leave the file alone. <clears throat> okay, we talked about DD earlier. If you give it a numeric line, um, like 10 DD, it would delete 10 lines, starting with the line the cursors are on. When you delete the line, it actually puts it in a buffer. So it's, it deletes it from the file, but it remembers it, so you can get at it later on. So if you've got 10 lines of code at a certain part of the file and you want to move them to the end or beginning or somewhere else, you could um, delete and then we'll, I'll show you in a minute how you can get them back. If you want to copy them, there's YY for a yank. Like, so this is actually a copy. So if you YY, that'll copy a single line. If you give it a numeric argument, YY, copy that many lines and put them in that buffer, <coughs> the original lines will still be there. So that's the difference. These basically do the same thing, except this, the DD deletes them from where they are right now. YY leaves the original ones alone with copies of it in this buffer that you press up above. <clears throat> a lowercase p will put the text from that buffer into the file, starting with the line below where you are. So it will append it, it will merge it, put it in. Well, so if you delete 10 lines, move to a different part of the file, and hit p, those 10 lines will be put right below the line where, you, where your cursor is. <clears throat> Capital P will do the same, but it will put it starting with the line above the cursor instead of the line below. And so that works with whether you deleted it or whether you yanked it to copy it. <clears throat> In VIM, which is the default text editor on most Linux systems, this was not the case with the original VI editor. But with VIM, you can mark locations within a file with an invisible marker. So let's say you've got a really long file you're on a certain line, you want to go look near the end of the file at something, you want to be able to get back to where you are real quickly, <clears throat> you can mark the line that you're on invisibly with a, a, a character anywhere from A to Z. So if, I, if I'm on a line in a file and I say MA, it marks that line with an A. Um, you won't see the A there or anything, you just have to remember that you marked it with an A. And it doesn't save that between edits. If you quit out of the editor and go back in, if that mark is not still there. Um, but that can be pretty handy. If you type, if you've marked a line with an A and you type apostrophe A, and that's the, the apostrophe on the right side, like below the two uh, the quotes, not the one in the upper left hand part of the thing. Um, so an apostrophe A will move the cursor to wherever you marked it, to the line uh, that was marked with an A. So for example, when I said, you know, if you type DD, it deletes the line you're on. If you type 10 DD, it'll delete 10 lines from the line you're on. If you've marked a line with an A and you type D apostrophe A, 
it'll delete all the text from whatever line you're on, either up or down to whatever line you marked with an A, and put it in that buffer so you can get it back if you want to move a big section of text or copy a big section of text. <coughs> I use that all the time. <coughs> so, uh, and then same with yank. If you yank, apostrophe A, it'll yank text, copy text from the line that you're on to the line marked with an A. You can have multiple lines marked with different, you know, any character from A to Z. That can be really super helpful in terms of defining sections of what you want to do. <clears throat> search and replace. If you want to search for something, you can use a slash, a forward slash, and then some string, and it will search forward for the next occurrence of whatever that is. You do have to sometimes be careful about special files, like a dot can be a I'm sorry, special characters. A dot sometimes can be a special character, an asterisk can be a special character, sometimes it won't look for exactly what you think you're looking for. <clears throat> but that's how you'd search forward for something. A question mark, which actually is a shift of the slash on a keyboard, will do the same thing with going backwards instead of forwards. Um, a lowercase n will repeat the previous search in the same direction, so if you search for something, and it's not the one you were looking for, but you know it's farther down, you can type N rather than having to type slash or you know, whatever it is again. <clears throat> um, capital N does the same, but it repeats the previous search in the opposite direction. So if you're searching forward, you type a capital N, it'll search backward for the same thing that you're looking for. Or vice versa, if you're searching backwards and you type a capital N, it'll search forwards. You can use that same sort of syntax for searching and replacing. So um, in this thing, uh, colon s means I want to substitute. And in this case, it would be, I would look for every occurrence of search string, slash, and then every, what I want to replace it with, slash. <clears throat> if you don't have the trailing g, it will only do it for the first occurrence on a line. If you put a slash g at the end of it, it replaces every occurrence on a line. So it will search for everything between these first two slashes and replace it with everything between the second two slashes. That's pretty handy for doing a big bulk search and replace in a file. Um, so yeah, if you leave the trailing g off, it does it only does the first occurrence on a line. <clears throat> and you can give that a range of lines. So by default, it searches through the whole file. But if I only want to do a search and replace between lines 32 and 56, I can say colon, the starting line, the ending line, or the comma in between, no space, s slash search slash replace. This will do the same thing, but only from lines 32 through 56 inclusive, meaning 32 and 56 are included in that range. <clears throat> so, but anywhere else in the file, it won't make that change. So that's kind of cool. Um, some shortcuts for bigger ranges. Um, if you do colon, dot, comma, dollar sign, dot means the line you're on right now, and dollar sign means the end of the file. So this would say, <clears throat> anywhere from here to the end of the file, do the search and replace, but not above. Similarly, colon, one, comma, dollar sign, that means uh, starting with line one and ending at the end of the file, or you could do colon, one, comma, dot if you want the current file current line to search and replace that would this particular syntax here would do the search and replace through the whole file uh, and there's a shortcut for that even if, there, if you do colon percent search and replace the percent is a shortcut for the whole file so that means look in the whole file search and replace um, and actually I think I maybe this that I think if you don't give it a line range it only does it on the line that you're on it doesn't do the whole file you have to do the percent of this kind of syntax to get the whole file. <clears throat> undo is a very powerful thing, and undo is recursive in VI, so <clears throat> it starts from when you first start editing the file, and it remembers all the changes that you've made. So you can undo changes all the way back to before you made any changes, or however many. There may be a limit, I'm not sure what it is. <clears throat> but the U command will undo the last command that you did. So you can undo um, you know, more than one to recursively go back. Um, there's a capital U, which I very 
rarely used, but it will undo all of the changes that you've made to the current line since you moved this. So if you move the cursor to a line, make a couple of changes. Oh, I don't want to do that because I have a capital U and it'll go back to the way it looked when you first moved your cursor. I don't know how useful that is or not. <clears throat> a period is super useful because it will repeat the last command. So if you made you know, some change, you know, did a 10 DD or whatever, you want to run it again, you can type in a period and it'll do exactly the same thing that you just did without having to type whatever it was that you used to do it. So that's a pretty, pretty useful command. Um, there's, oh, it, it's very customizable and you can do some really elegant stuff in terms of deleting or moving or substituting and stuff like that. Um, there's a lot more information about the VI editor uh, on those, this, uh, Unix is a two letter, four letter word, VI is two letter abbreviation, or Unix help for users, so it's both have more information about how to, how to use VI. This is a start to kind of get some kid in the and do some of the more common stuff. And then this was the, if you're on Windows and you want to have an X server, this has information on how to get that set up. I think that's it. So, any questions? Yes? Question regarding the shells. Yes. Uh, uh, how are we supposed to know uh, what, which shell to use for any specific project? That's a good question. It's really personal preference. I'm I'm more familiar with the TC shell, so I typically tend to use that if I'm logging in and, and doing work. Okay, um, is it just about uh, the experience of using that shell, or are there any hard differences? Well, the, the way that you do things is different. Um, like, for example, um, I don't know if you can set a numeric variable in Bash. So a lot of my shell scripting, if I'm looping through something and I want to do something 10 times, <clears throat> or I want to set a date that I you know, add and subtract to, I'll usually use TC shell for that because I know how to, how to work with the numeric variables in there. Um, maybe you can do it in Bash, I'm just not sure how. But, I mean, a lot of that comes down to personal preference. And in the lab here, I have all, everybody's accounts are usually using TCSH as a default, mainly because historically we've used Gempack. All, all of the Gempack settings are done for TCSH. <clears throat> More recently, a lot of what we're doing is in Python, which is happier in Bash. So at some point, I may bite the bullet and try to translate everything I've got set up in my default C shell startup files into a bash startup file so you could have bash as a shell and everything would still work. But I just I haven't had the the time or the inclination to, to do that. But, but yeah, in terms of I mean like in here it's usually TCSH. On a Mac you're gonna be running ZSH by default, which is very much like Bash. Um, if you install Linux, your default shell is most likely going to be Bash. It's almost almost exclusively to the point where uh, I don't think they even install TCSH by default. Like you have to add, to add that on afterwards. I mean, it depends on what kind of an install. Usually, when you install Linux, they usually have different install options. You can do like a minimal install, which is sort of like enough to run the operating system and be able to install this stuff, but that's about it. <clears throat> you can do like install everything, you know, all of whatever is available. I used to do that in the olden days, but then I got burned a couple times where there were some security vulnerabilities in software that I didn't know I was running, but it was running because I had installed everything. And so my philosophy now is I do a minimal install and only add on what I know we need to use so that I know what's on there and there's nothing you know, that I wasn't aware of that we had installed. So, and if you're not sure what shell you're using, you can type echo dollar sign all capitals shell and it should show you what shell you're using. There is a command, um, if you want to change your shell, you as a user are able to do that. It's CHSH, and then the path to the shell that you want to use. So, <clears throat> for example, you could say CHSH space slash bin slash bash, B-A-S-H, and it would change your default shell from TCSH to bash. Be careful, because then your startup file will be different, and some things that used to work might not. Anything else? If in your day-to-day -day work you come across something that doesn't make sense or you can't figure out how to do something, 
my office is down the hall. I'm happy to help you out. So I hope it was helpful. You know, this kind of a class is something where it's a fire hose of information and you're not going to remember it all, but you know, hopefully someday you'll be working and you'll be like, oh yeah, I remember Pete said something about that. And then you got my little sheet and you can go look for it. So, anyways, thanks for coming. Thank you. And happy